I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Welcome to this edition of The Pagan Invasion. The concept of evolution has dominated the thinking of the scientific community for nearly a century and a half. Through the years, many have hoped with great anticipation that evolution's theories would prove to be true and would thus answer the great mysteries of life. Yet as we stand at the edge of the 21st century, we are no closer to knowing anything about the mechanisms of the evolutionary process than we were during Darwin's time. To this day, scientists have failed to agree on many evolutionary claims, including how it happened, when it happened, and what changed into what, and how non-life became life. Should the theory of evolution prove to be invalid, the only other explanation for existence of life would be the result of the handiwork of a master designer and creator. And that's a conclusion that the scientific community seems to avoid considering at any cost. Most people are under the impression that Charles Darwin discovered the law of evolution and that it is a modern scientific fact. That assumption, however, is not true. Ancient Greeks, Indian mystics, and many other cultures have believed in various forms of evolution throughout the ages. What Darwin did was popularize a theory of evolution in 1859 with the publication of his book, The Origin of Species by Natural Selection. Darwin has been said to be responsible for perhaps the most fundamental of all intellectual revolutions in the history of mankind. Yet in his book, he doesn't give any scientific evidences for evolution, cites no examples of new species resulting from natural selection, produces no examples of transitional forms, and documents no evolutionary mechanisms. Darwin was not the brilliant scientist most would think him to be, but a theologian, and surprisingly a Freemason. In fact, his only formal training was in theology at Cambridge University in England. Today, prominent evolutionary scientists continue to attack and contradict their own hypothesis, which should be a warning to us of its weakness as a scientific theory. Yet this crisis doesn't appear to daunt or discourage its promotion. Public institutions such as museums, libraries, high schools and universities continue to propagate evolution as though the scientific community has agreed on evolution as being fact. During the course of this program, we will be talking to leading scientists from around the world. We will evaluate their claims and examine the evidence. Does evolution really provide the answer to our existence? Or could it be the hoax of the century? The controversial question of how life began has puzzled mankind for thousands of years. There are two schools of thought. One idea is that God is the master of nature, the creator and ruler of the universe, who designed each kind of life on earth with deliberate intention. This concept is known as creation science, or abrupt appearance. An opposing view, which is predominant in today's society and scientific community, is known as evolution. It teaches that non-living matter unintentionally changed into life and developed with time. Single-celled forms progressed into more complex multi-celled forms, resulting in the ultimate development of man. The principles of evolution influence every aspect of our society. Around the world, prestigious museums display evolutionary perspectives. National parks and historical sites have become showcases for evolutionary information. Science magazines, geography and natural history publications, children's books, and TV specials present evolution to the public as fact. Many of today's most popular films, amusement parks, and even breakfast cereals promote evolutionary concepts to eager audiences. 
Textbooks that develop evolutionary theories are compulsory reading for public high school, college, and university students. Evolution has become the foundation for most scientific disciplines, including paleontology, geology, biology, and astronomy. The aim of many scientists is to eliminate supernatural explanations and provide naturalistic answers. Consequently, many must reject God's supernatural intervention in a miraculous creation. The parallel ideas of reincarnation and evolution have always been closely linked to the occultic beliefs of many of the world's pagan religions. But during the mid-19th century, this philosophy was suddenly given scientific respectability worldwide by an Englishman, Charles Darwin, who has become known as the father of evolution. The majority opinion of the day held to the biblical account of a creator god who intentionally designed each basic form of plant and animal. Although raised a Christian, Darwin rebelled against this idea and in his theory saw a way to formulate a process without a creator. This is the home of Charles Darwin between 1842 and 1882. It's in this study that Charles Darwin produced his great works. In fact, he used to sit in this chair. It's here he wrote his famous On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. Charles Darwin is a giant among men in modern world because he developed the theory of evolution which transformed the scientific world. The theory of evolution by natural descent was in vogue long before Darwin's time. What Darwin did was provide a rational explanation of how it might have operated. So rational indeed that many people said, why didn't I think of that? Many people felt most comfortable. Uh, as far as Darwin was concerned, he was their hero. He provided the, the explanation that they were seeking. Modern science was born in 1620 when Lord Bacon wrote Novum Organum. Between 1620 and 1860, most scientists believed in the creator and in the creation of man. Today, few scientists believe in creation or a creator. What happened? Who are some of the molders of the modern mind? I'm standing here by Thomas Huxley in the Museum of Natural History. He's been called Darwin's bulldog because he took the theory of Darwin and gave a forceful presentation of it. Huxley believed that you could explain everything in nature apart from the creator by pure natural laws. We have to remember that after all, creationism was what everybody thought not all that many years ago. And creationism was overthrown in the scientific community by evolutionary thinking. For the most part, Darwin's book was considered blasphemous by the average, average person in England at that time. Karl Marx, an atheist and the originator of communism, was delighted to find a scientific rationale in the theory of evolution, which he claimed gave validation to his new philosophy. Marx admired Darwin, and the two communicated and corresponded. In appreciation, Marx even attempted to dedicate his greatest atheistic work, Das Kapital, to Darwin. There were communists of the day, and Karl Marx was one of these, who saw Darwin's theory as giving scientific credibility to what was previously a, merely a philosophy. The philosophy of socialism, the philosophy of communism, it all became scientific and credible with Darwin's theory. The people who have devised the concept of evolution, starting with Charles Darwin himself, and even before him, have come up with a concept that starts with a vacuum. Then there was an explosion in that vacuum called the Big Bang that created the uh, Milky Way galaxy with up to 200 billion stars all circulating in intricate precision, the result of that explosion, and it gets all the way up to man without God getting into the act anywhere along the line. That is really the way it is taught in all of our public schools today. Darwin's whole purpose was to explain all of life without design and purpose, without the need for a creator by purely mechanistic or natural processes. Luther Sunderland, former aerospace engineer and author of the book Darwin's Enigma. Now what is this materialistic or natural explanation for evolution? 
It says that on the early Earth, in a soupy ocean, some chemicals got together and formed spontaneously the first living cell. Now that was no minor operation because the simplest single-celled organism we know anything about has in its genes and chromosomes about as much data as there are letters in the world's largest library, the trillion letters. No way in the world could random processes have organized that much data. Most life forms are comprised of billions of these complex cells which once again display themselves in perfect order. The mathematical impossibility of the human body being formed accidentally surpasses the logic of an explosion in a printing shop, resulting in the formation of a dictionary. Appearing in the film The Evolution Conspiracy is Dr. John Morris, who is head of geological studies for the Institute for Creation Research in San Diego, California. I spoke with Dr. Morris and asked him to explain the differences between creation and evolution and to describe how recent scientific discoveries had affected both these theories. Evolution is the idea that all of the life forms that we see living today and that we see recorded in the fossil record have all come from a common ancestor. The idea is that some four or so billion years ago, a single cell organism came into existence from non-living chemicals. It, it was spontaneous generation. It, it just became alive from non-living material. And then through a process of modification over the years, through mutation, natural selection, genetic drift, whatever, it has uh, evolved. It has um, changed, altered into the various forms of life that we see today. That's the basic concept of evolution, that all of life has come from a common ancestor. The idea about creation, however, is, is the opposite to that, that each basic category of plant or animal has come directly by a, a creative act, that it did not descend from uh, a, an ancestor that was different from itself. Dogs have always been dogs. People have always been people. People did not come from a non-human ancestor. The other idea about creation is that once this category was created, it was created with the um, genetic makeup, the DNA code that was designed so that their descendants would always produce that category. It would not evolve, as it were, into something else. The creation model, with its concept of, of categories of animals appearing abruptly, uh, is sometimes called the abrupt appearance model. The idea that things got here abruptly without having descended from a different sort of thing. And then uh, stasis is the idea that it's been stationary since it's got here. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't change in anything else. Both these views seem in such opposition to each other. How can scientists have such differing views of the origins of life? That's a very good question, and I think this is really the, the bottom line question. It's important to understand that both creationists and evolutionists have the same evidence to study. We have the same rocks, the same fossils, the same living systems. Everything is the same, but yet our interpretations are so dramatically different. A lot of times non-scientists say, how can scientists who are supposed to be open-minded and non-biased, how can they come to such dramatically different interpretations of the evidence? We've got to dispel that, that common notion that scientists are unbiased. Scientists are, are some of the most uh, biased people you'll ever meet. In fact, it's impossible not to be biased. It's, it's not a matter of whether or not you're biased. It's, it's what bias are you biased with. My contention is that the creation bias is a better bias with which to study the evidence. The fossils, which have long been thought to be the proof of evolution, are now recognized by almost everybody, evolutionists included, to be at best an embarrassment to evolution. Because what the fossil record shows, and, and all the leading evolutionists will tell you this very same thing, that the fossil record shows that things appear abruptly. That's the way they say it, that, that they got here abruptly. Now they're talking maybe a rapid evolution, but they say the fossil record is characterized by abrupt appearance, and stasis. But that's the definition of creation. Evolutionists have to say, well, a, a small isolated group evolved so rapidly that it left no transitional fossils between, between these basic categories of animals. And we say, how do you know it happened at all? Over a thousand species a year are becoming extinct. That comes down to three a day. Is there any compensation for this within the evolutionary theory? 
Actually, one of the basic predictions of the evolution model is that new species will be coming into existence, you know, all along the time. But what we see when we really look at the world, I mean, what the facts of science show is that species just don't come into existence. On a daily basis, species are going extinct. What we see is extinction. That's what science tells us. Now, the evolutionary historical reconstruction is that new species are farming. But the evolutionary reconstruction does not fit well with observed science. In wanting to steer clear of the concept of a creator, evolutionary scientists have ironically and unwittingly adopted an idea which forms the basis of many pagan religions. In an attempt to avoid traditional biblical religion, they actually promote another. The results have been devastating. Many areas of science, such as biology and geology, have been compromised. In searching for evidence to prove evolution, scientists have pursued a series of wild goose chases only to come up empty-handed. Perhaps the biggest waste of time has been the search for the missing links in the fossil record, which to this day are still missing. Let's take a look at the progress made by evolutionary scientists thus far. If evolution has really occurred, we ought to be able to see the evidence in the fossil record. After all, that's the record of the past. But if we look at that fossil record carefully, we see that there are no recorded instances of one type of an animal ever changing into another. There's no transitional forms. One of my advisors is uh, working in, in the field of paleontology and has been working on the uh, distribution of fossils in the record and has found that uh, there are no interspecific transitional forms, something that, of course, the creation model would have predicted and did predict long before this research was done. We ought to see cats, and we ought to see dogs, and we ought to see cogs and dats. We ought to see them in between. We ought not to be able to divide them like we are now. But that doesn't usually stop my evolutionary colleagues. They will make the statements over and over again that the, the fossil record is replete with these transitional forms. There are myriad transitional forms. Uh, there's really no problem uh, finding transitional forms. It's completely false to say that there's a, a lacking of... Uh, transitional forms. We have plenty of them, more than sometimes we can cope with. In fact, there are so many transitional forms between species that we must often fall back on statistical analysis to separate one from the other. So the claim that there are no intermediates is simply a false claim. During their interviews, several of these prominent scientists contradicted themselves, admitting that no transitional forms had been found and proceeded to offer excuses for the lack of evidence. And the problem of transitional forms <coughs> is one that all honest uh, paleontologists have a problem with. The uh, geologic record is incomplete. Uh, it's incomplete because of erosion that has eroded things away. One of the things that also uh, makes it a little more difficult in the fossil record is the rapidity with which uh, evolution acts in very s short bursts. Um, it doesn't leave many transitional forms behind. Let's go to the British Museum of Natural History to the man who wrote the book there on evolution, Dr. Colin Patterson. I wrote to Dr. Patterson and asked him why he didn't put a single picture of an intermediate form or a connecting link in his book on evolution. Dr. Patterson now, who has seven million fossils in his museum, said the following when he answered my letter, quote, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I certainly would have included them, unquote. Later, he said, I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one might make a watertight argument. Because no fossil records exist to confirm evolutionary assumptions, dubious artworks are relied upon and exhibited as fact. Misleading artistic interpretations depict fish magically growing legs and changing into amphibians. Extinct deer-like creatures mysteriously turning into horses and monkeys becoming humans. 
Where non-existent transitional skeletons are needed to prove a point, skilled craftsmen substitute plastic and wooden models. I'm very concerned about the way our museums present evolution as though it were a proven fact. And actually, false information is being presented. You see, since the museums don't have the transitional forms, they have to make them up out of thin air. The November 1980 edition of Science Digest shows a drawing of a whale with legs as an evolutionary link between whales and cows. But the only fossil evidence for this mythological transition is a skull and several teeth, no leg bones. Niles Eldridge at the American Museum said, you're only limited by the credulity of your audience and your own imagination in making up these stories of what changed into what and what the intermediate forms were. If we're talking about seeing evolution today, uh, seeing one species changing into another species, uh, that's not going to happen. Although there must be, from an evolutionary perspective, many transitional forms out there, the likelihood of finding any one of them is extremely low. The more we learn about paleontology, that is fossils, the more certain we are that evolution is based on faith alone. The National Academy of Science is the official advisor to the U.S. government on questions of science. In its publications, it falsely claims that the missing links that troubled Darwin are no longer missing. This is misrepresentation which deceives millions because after 120 years of exhaustive searching, Darwin's missing links are still missing. Yet this academy and evolutionists continue to perpetuate the mythical theory that man developed from ape-like creatures. Richard Leakey, who is one of the most uh, well-known anthropologists, said that if he were asked to draw a family tree for man, he would just have to draw a huge question mark because the evidence is too scanty to possibly know man's evolutionary origin, and he didn't think we're ever going to find it. To aid and abet evolutionary concepts, artistic depictions have gone beyond ethical boundaries. Despite having no foundation for the ape-to-man theory, scientists and artists continue to dupe the public with lifelike but imaginary illustrations. These artists vainly entertain natural progressions of apes to humans and presume their hair color, skin tones, and even facial expressions from no more than a tooth, a piece of bone, or even no evidence at all. National Geographic magazine, which doesn't attempt to hide its evolutionary bias, admits that these fossilized footprints are identical to human footprints. Yet artists take the liberty to accommodate evolutionary theory and illustrate ape-like features to fit ape-like creatures. All because biased dating processes insist that these footprints were found in rock layers said to exist before humans. Now, today we have evolutionists who would like us to believe there is solid evidence for evolution. Before the public, they generally create the impression that the evidence is just like solid gold, that man has evolved from some ape-like creature. Dr. Donald Johansson, director of the Institute of Human Origins, discovered Lucy, an alleged ape-to-man missing link. The human family and the ape family diverged and went on their own individual and separate evolutionary trajectories. We don't know precisely the, the, what the common ancestor was for that, but we know that it resembles something like what is called Ramapithecus. Ramapithecus. That was formed out of nothing but a fragment of a jaw and several teeth. And for many, many years, Ramapithecus was held up as our ape-like ancestor. But now Dr. Pillbeam at the Yale Harvard Peabody Museum, when I interviewed him, he said, we have found about 40 of these creatures now, some of them fairly complete, and they are not on the direct line to becoming man at all. They're more like an orangutan. Dr. Pillbeam of Yale, who first claimed that Ramapithecus was an ancestor of man, now suggests that it isn't. Yet evolutionists continue to cite Ramapithecus as an ape-man link. Another so-called missing link, Java Man, was concocted by Eugene Dubois when he found an ape-like skull fragment and then 50 feet away, he found a human leg bone. However, just before he died, Dubois confessed that he'd also found two human skulls at this same location. And he admitted that the skull fragment 
belong to a gibbon and not to an ape man. Homo erectus is probably best known as Java man. And it was at this stage in human evolution that they began to make and use these large triangular hand axes. Brains expanded over a thousand cc's. Uh, body proportions similar to ours evolved. And we were firmly on the road uh, to later hominids, including modern humans. This hoax is still accepted by evolutionists today, and it's presented to the public as a true missing link. If you think the Java Man hoax is incredible, wait until you hear all the facts surrounding Johansson's Lucy, this little three and a half foot adult skeleton, which looks just like a chimpanzee. Uh, as you know, Lucy was found in 1974, and sometimes I refer to her as the woman who shook up man's family tree, because she represents for us the oldest, most complete skeleton we have of any human ancestor known to anthropologists. Now, the species Australopithecus alfarensis, as represented by Lucy, is a species that we feel is ancestral to modern humans. And the significance of Lucy is that she gives us a good idea of what our ancestors looked like some three million years ago. We can learn from her skeleton about the way that she walked, for example. When we look at her knee joint, when we look at her pelvis, we see that she walked like you and I, instead of like a chimpanzee. Johansson said, even though this is a very ape-like creature, it walked upright. Well, the pygmy chimp today wanders around in the rainforest walking upright almost all the time, so that doesn't prove anything. Actually, the only features of Lucy which even hint at erect posture are the knee and, and hip joints. Dr. Charles Oxnard, with a sophisticated computer analysis, has concluded that Johansson's claims for the hip are unfounded, and it must be pointed out that the knee was not even found with Lucy. This knee joint was found over a mile away 200 feet deeper than the other bones. She comes closer to representing, I think, what the average person thinks of as the missing link than any other fossil we had, had ever found in Africa. So she has extraordinary importance in terms of understanding the very earliest phases of human evolution. Richard Leakey and others are now claiming that in all likelihood Lucy is really a mosaic of, of two or more species. This isn't funny. What is funny is that they claim that creation isn't scientific. Uh, the next thing back was Piltdown Man. Here was a case where a human skull had been doctored up along with a jaw of an orangutan to make the jaw look somewhat human. The teeth were filed. It turned out to be a pure fraud. Piltdown Man was a purposeful fraud and it fooled the world's greatest evolutionists simply because they so much wanted to believe that there was some evidence for evolution. Neanderthal Man was originally found in the Neanderthal Valley of Germany. These creatures almost all look very modern, but several of them, two or three, had a very stooped over, brutish appearance. Now, however, Two scientists have gone over to the museums in Europe from Johns Hopkins University, got these bones out of the museums and x-rayed the ones that had a very stooped over appearance. And lo and behold, they discovered that the stooped over creatures had rickets or some vitamin D deficiency disease such as arthritis. They have reclassified the Neanderthals from a separate species, now put them back into Homo sapiens, the same as modern man. Now, Nebraska man consisted of nothing but a single tooth. And around this single tooth, pictures were drawn showing an ape-like creature that had evolved into man. It turned out later that this tooth was nothing but the tooth of an extinct pig. And this is a case now where uh, a pig made a monkey out of an evolutionist. I think man has always been man. The scientific evidence shows this, and this, of course, is very consistent with the account of creation that is presented in the book of Genesis. Behind closed doors, or occasionally when speaking very candidly, the evolutionists admit there is really no evidence that man evolved from the apes. Artworks in museums and textbooks show the nature of evolution. What is the truth behind these artworks? 
you know, I talked to an artist about a year or so ago who was an artist for an evolutionary textbook, and, and he was told to draw a picture of one of these uh, missing links between, between an ape-like ancestor and man, and, and he was given the, uh, the skull of a, of, a, of a creature to work from. The drawing that he made of the, of the creature that would have had that sort of skull looked very ape-like. And when he showed it to the author, he said, oh, no, that'll never do. You must make it look more human. So he went back and drew it again and made it look more human. They said, oh, no, that's still not good enough. You have to make it look clearly, nearly man-like. And so he had to redraw it again. And, and they kept rejecting it. Finally, he says, I refuse to lie in my artwork. The facts are that this thing is an ape. It's not a human ape missing link. Many times I think, that artistic license and imagination substitutes for good science among my evolutionary colleagues. How has evolution managed to become so pervasive in our society? I'm convinced the reason most people believe in evolution is because most people believe in evolution. The facts of science never did particularly point to evolution particularly now the fossil record, the record of life in the past, just doesn't give any clue that any basic category of animal has ever changed into another basic category. But we're all taught it. We're taught it from day one in schools, and, and we're also taught that if you don't believe in evolution, you're, you're an ignorant uh, person, a, a fundamentalist or something. But in reality, the, the evidence just doesn't fit, and never has fit evolution very well. And many evolutionists now are abandoning evolution. They're looking for some other explanation of, of the origin of things. In school, students are taught that evolution is a fact. Is it proper for scientists to claim that evolution is a fact? Yeah, I remember at the Scopes trial in 1925, that the, the, all the arguments that were used in favor of evolution have now been disproved. They're, they're no longer even thought to be proof of evolution, such as Nebraska man. This was a, a, a human ancestor, so it was thought. It was based on one tooth that was found, and from that tooth was built up not only the whole person, but the family, the wife, the kids, the whole, the whole community. Um, just off of one tooth, and it was found out later that that tooth was really not even a human tooth, it was from a pig. Our Piltdown Man was another one that was used as proof, and now we know that Piltdown was a fraud. Well, those things were taught as fact, and people believed evolution because of the proof that was given, but now we know that those proofs were in fact wrong, but people still believe in evolution because that you see how it works. They were taught it was a fact, they believed it, and it got to where um, the evidences were unimportant anymore. I'm convinced that this is, this, is such, this is so destructive to the minds of our students. They're not taught how to think. They're not taught how to evaluate evidence. They're, they're only taught to remember what you've been taught, and then if it changes, you remember the new stuff. You see how it works. You know, I think this issue of creation evolution goes far beyond just how we look at rocks and fossils. I think it's really a, a basic foundational issue. You see, if, if we are created, if we are created by a, a God who designed us to operate in a certain fashion, that means that that God has the authority to set the rules on our behavior and the authority to set the rules for, for, for uh, violating that behavior. So. Our job is to agree with and submit to those rules. But you see, if we've just descended from the animals, if we're just an ape that lost our tail somewhere along the line, then nobody owns us. We set our own rules and, and we do what we want to do. This, I think, is a commentary on our modern society that everybody's doing their own thing, that, that you know, we're, we're after our own gratification. Charles Darwin himself warned that unless transitional forms could be found in the fossil record, the theory of evolution was worthless speculation. Today's adherents to evolution have failed to heed this warning and continue to hold to a belief in evolution despite the complete lack of evidence. The evolutionists realize that they can no longer rely on the fossil record to give them any support. So what they've done is they've come up with a very crafty alternative to the Darwinian concept of evolution. They call it the punctuated equilibria concept. One of the really exciting developments in evolutionary theory in the last uh, 10 to 15 years has been the theory that uh, Instead of evolving very gradually over a long period of time, uh, that evolution came in short bursts that were interspersed with uh, much uh, longer periods where virtually nothing happened. 
You see, this solves all kinds of problems intellectually for the evolutionist. He doesn't have to look at the fossil record. There is no evidence in the fossil record that one type of animal ever changed into another type of animal. Punctuated equilibria comes along and says that isolated populations of animals evolved rapidly and left no fossil trace. But this is an argument from lack of data. There are no transitional forms, and that's used then as proof of the brand of evolution called punctuated equilibria. This is bad science. With this new information, we're trying to refine our view of evolution. And uh, what's emerging is a much more powerful synthesis uh, of the evolutionary theories. I'm convinced that the idea of punctuated equilibria is really a desperate attempt to salvage evolutionary theory. Punctuated equilibrium, while attempting to explain the lack of intermediate forms between neighboring species, neglects to address the real issue that asks why there are no transitions between major categories of life forms. One extraordinary answer was offered by Goldschmidt's hopeful monster theory. Who would believe, for instance, that a reptile laid an egg and a bird came crawling out of the egg, as Goldschmidt had said about this theory when he first came up with it? We are literally going back to the very foundations of evolutionary principles and reevaluating once again the mechanisms whereby evolution takes place. Unfortunately, I think a number of uh, those outside the scientific fields uh, that deal with evolution interpret this as a uh, casting doubt on the very, uh, of the, what I would call the fact of evolution. What it does say to us is that the evolutionists are running scared. It seems like almost every new development in science is converging to destroy evolution. Whether we're talking about new discoveries in astronomy or in paleontology or biology, this is true. I just realized finally after studying all this material and thinking this thing through that the evidence, the scientific evidence for creation is a lot stronger than the scientific evidence for evolution. In the last decade, most of the basic pillars upon which evolution has stood have collapsed and the theory is in chaos. Now unfortunately, at this time, the evolutionists are crying louder than ever before that evolution is a fact. Well, it's my personal view that evolution is a dead certain fact. Evolution. There is no question that it happened. The geological record cannot be explained in any other way than through uh, the evolutionary process. Many times you'll hear the statement that evolution is a fact, but a scientist should know better than to make a statement like that. If evolution has ever occurred, it was not observed, and therefore it's outside the realm of science. It's inaccessible to scientists and the scientific method. Many of my evolutionary colleagues are, are coming up with, with rather bizarre theories. It seems that they recognize that evolution doesn't make good sense scientifically, and so they're, they're forced to come up with these incredible imaginary ideas. For instance, some now recognize that uh, the spontaneous generation of life from non-life is, is scientifically impossible. So what do they do? Do they, do they attribute it to a creator? No, they, they claim that life came from outer space. Well, they can believe that if they want to, but they shouldn't call it science, and they shouldn't teach it in schools as if it were science. Evolution is simply a matter of making up stories in place of the actual scientific data. Science used to be the search for truth. Now it seems it's deteriorated into the search for a believable story. The scientist who can make up the most plausible sounding story and can get it printed or get the media to tell about it, he is the one that becomes famous. I can say that as a scientist I see zero evidence that evolution has occurred or that any is going on today. One scientist I spoke with said that even if evolution is not true, there is no way it could ever be retracted because it had gone too far. Millions of textbooks would have to be reprinted and museums all over the world would have to tear down their exhibits. Society would never trust science again. Paul the Apostle speaks of men who do not want to retain God in their minds. And this is the only reason why the evolutionary theory is still held on to, because it offers to man the explanation for his existence apart from God. But as Paul the Apostle also said, professing themselves to be wise, they have become fools because they have changed the glory of an incorruptible God and they have fashioned it like unto corruptible beast. And they have worshipped and served the creature 
more than the Creator who is blessed forevermore. And that's the problem. The worship of the creature rather than the Creator. But that in itself is irrational. To look at the beauty and the design of creation and then to worship the creation itself is not rational. To look at a rose, to admire its beauty, to smell its fragrance and say, oh, that's God. No, that's irrational. That is a creation of God. It shows the signs of God in the design. And so the wise person will go beyond the creature and worship the Creator who is blessed forevermore. Don't get caught short. Go all the way and worship God, the Creator. Within all of us, there is a God-shaped vacuum. Throughout the ages, man has attempted to fill that void with the things of the world. But it is only through a relationship with our Creator that we can be truly satisfied. His Holy Scriptures reveal the way in which we can be reconciled to God, and that is through the provisions of His Son, Jesus Christ. I'm Chuck Smith. And I'm Carol Matriciana. Join us again for another edition of The Pagan Invasion.